Hey everyone, welcome back. Pokemon Sun and Moon have been out for a while, so I wanted to take some time to talk about something from the end game. I assume by now everyone's had a chance to beat the game, and if not... So, this is something interesting worth considering. The end game topic I wanted to talk about today is the Ultra Beasts, the alien life forms that were dropped in Alola by the mysterious Ultra Wormhole, leading to Ultra Space. And if you think the word Ultra is going to get tiring by the end of this video, you're right. These things were my favorite concept. These things were my favorite concept going into the game. Even though they can't really be caught until after you've beaten the main campaign, I still think the concept of them was decently utilized, even though I would have liked to see a bit more involvement. And I know I'm not alone in that. Now, no one really has any direct information about them other than the developers, and they don't really seem to be following up on them. For one reason or another. Everything I'm about to blather on about is basically just hypothesis and conjecture based on the little bits of information the game gives us, plus my own understanding of the nature of the universe, which is admittedly just above casual. It's also a great opportunity to talk about a, another subject that is very relevant these days, that of exoplanets. Planets that we have found orbiting other stars than our own. Science has made some amazing finds lately, like the Proxima B world, just outside our solar system, relatively, and the Trappist-1 system, with potentially three habitable rock planets around it. But I'll talk about those a bit later. For now, let's go back to Pokémon and the Ultra Beasts. What I've been mulling over lately is... What world are they from? What's it like? I will hereafter refer to it as Beast World. I consider it Ultra World, but I'm sick of the word Ultra by the end of this script. With that out of the way, before we bounce around theories, let's see what we really know about these creatures so far. Let's begin with the traits that all seven of them share. Firstly, a big assumption I'm going forward with here is that I'm assuming that they're all from the same world. My theories just crumble without this assumption, and I have no evidence that they're not all from the same world, so if everyone's in agreement, we'll just move forward with that thought. The first notable thing that I find they all share is a lot of power. They're all absolute beasts in battle. Even those considered weak among them are only weak because all their stats are in the same basket. Let's look at that, actually. Guzzlord only barely trails behind Chansey and Blissey for the highest HP stat in the game. And that's a tall order to fill. It even beats out Final Form Zygarde. And looking at the list of top 10 highest special attack stats in the game, Zerkatry is the only one on that list who isn't in some kind of altered form. Primal, Mega, Deoxys' attack form. Going down past number 10, the next unaltered Pokémon we see there is Mewtwo. Frickin' Mewtwo. So yeah, these guys are strong, and those two I just listed are the weakest of the bunch. Accentuating this extreme power a lot of them have is the ability that they all share, Beast Boost. It uses residual energy from the wormhole they came through to boost their highest stat when they make a KO, allowing them to keep up momentum. It's an incredibly powerful ability. Lore-wise, it's also this residual energy sprinkled throughout Alola that allowed certain Pokémon to mutate and gain power boosts and become the totem Pokémon of certain areas. Whether or not the Ultra Beasts had different abilities on their home planet is... unclear. We have absolutely no evidence towards that. They don't even have hidden abilities. Beast Boost is their only option after passing through that portal. Another commonality, along with the... Other extra-dimensional Pokémon, Solgaleo, Lunala, and Necrozma, is that they all learn their moves at levels that are prime numbers. As in numbers that can't be divided by any number except one and themselves, without leaving a decimal point. Prime numbers are, in their nature, strange and weird, and I think that that lends itself not to anything lore-wise, but more to an idea 
that these creatures are strange and alien and don't follow conventional rules. It's more of a thematic thing than anything. They're also different from other Pokémon in a way that's quantifiable by technology. The Rotom decks, the most advanced Pokédex we've seen yet, despite the fact that it can't have a national dex function, the useless piece of can't register them as seen, only as caught. And it can't even get a name on them until you've captured one. On top of that, Pokeballs have a limited effectiveness on them. Anything less than a Master Ball will have its catch rate multiplier cut down to 1, even if it would have a higher catch rate. Quick Balls at the beginning of battle, Dust Balls at night, Net Balls against Buzzswole and Feromosa... Doesn't help. They'll recognize them as Pokémon, but just barely. They're also not unique. They're not legendary Pokémon. There are multiple instances of each of them in the game, except Guzzlord, but we hear about other Guzzlords in-game. They've also appeared in Alola in the past, but never in such high numbers as happens now. And perhaps most importantly, these things still share the qualities of Pokémon. Types, moves, capturability, even though the Pokeballs have a hard time with them. And I think that's everything they universally share, as far as I can recall. Everything else has exceptions and nuances that I'm going to get into next. But first, where do we go from here? Well, I say let's look at what we do and don't know, and see what we can glean from that, and see if that can help us learn a bit about the world they came from. We have a very small picture of what their world is like, so we're going to need a slightly uncomfortable amount of conjecture to paint even a foggy picture. But first of all, something that I think we can all automatically agree on, their world is probably really dangerous. Either pressures from each other or from their environment has forced them to evolve aggressive and strong and hardy. Now, aggression isn't rare in Pokémon. This we can agree on. You wake it up, it attacks you. You sprinkle water on it, it attacks you. The Ultra Beasts are no different. They didn't come here to invade or anything. They were dropped here by accident. It's as much of a surprise to them as it is to us. So when they seek out the player, they're actually smelling the residual effects of the portal you travel through in-game, thinking that you're away home. And when they find out you're not, they attack you. I guess that's just how they deal with disappointment. But one thing that does prove, they're no strangers to combat, and they aren't afraid to use their physical abilities. And another interesting point, lore-wise, the most dangerous of their kind is the Dark-type Guzzlord. And two of their strongest combatants are Bug and Fighting-type. Both of them, the dual types. The two types that Dark is most weak to. Coincidence? Probably. But I find it interesting. Maybe it's not so much of an accident. They probably have run-ins with Guzzlord from time to time and have to fight them. They also both begin with Lunge, which is a strong bug-type move that lowers the opponent's attack stat, which happens to be Guzzlord's second highest stat. So the chances are high that occasionally these things fight each other. And I also really believe they fight against their environment a lot. Now, to be honest, that does seem like a pretty high claim. What environment is there to fight against? We've seen almost none of it. So what do we know about what we have seen? Well, in this little cave, which is the only part of Beast World we get to see and traverse in the game, what do we have? Weird rock formations, uh, some kind of light source near the back, quite bright actually, glittering or phosphorescent stones, the only thing we see living there are several instances of the frail, parasitic jellyfish ultra beast Nilego. But technically there was something else living there. People. Guzma and Lusamine were there for a while, and survived their trip there. Not in bad shape. Well, Lusamine was in bad shape, but that was for a completely different reason. They might have been there for days if you're like me and felt that the Pokedex was looking a little dry by the time you got to Pony Island. 
Yo, Lily, I know you're worried about your mom, but I have way more seen than caught, and I gotta fix that. Have you seen those executors? They're rad. Now, while you're in Beast World, Lily mentions that the air is thick and hard to breathe, but it's not unbreathable. Now, a couple things come to my mind as possibilities for thick air. It could be slightly more dense due to higher gravity, but no one really complains much about uh, them feeling heavier while they're there. So maybe heavier elements are acting as filler in place of our lighter elements in our air. Most of this is nitrogen, about 60 to 70 percent of it. Perhaps they have slightly less nitrogen or something in their air and have, oh, I don't know, carbon. That's my thought. You'll see why. And the Ultra Beasts aren't crazy about our side either. According to Wick, half the purpose of the Beast Balls is to help them survive more comfortably in our atmosphere. So yeah, the air is similar enough for both parties to breathe the other world's air, but it's not comfortable. Given the diversity of planets out there, it's a pretty big lottery that the atmospheres are that similar. And if the gravity isn't any higher, it must mean that the world's about the same size as ours. If it's any bigger or smaller, it's not by enough to make it a noticeable difference immediately. Now, in what will seem like a complete leap of logic, I'm going to take a stab at what the surface of the planet looks like, just based on a couple of factors that I thought about as I was playing. And this might also shed some light on the potential behaviors of the Ultra Beasts themselves. Now, as I was formulating this theory, two things stuck out to me right off the bat. First of all, the eyes and skin of the Ultra Beasts. Something about that bugged me, and I think I know why now. Secondly, Lily's clothes. Now, okay, I know you're thinking, that's not much to go off, and it isn't. But this was just what got the ball rolling for me. And I'll explain why. But ultimately, I think that these factors can lead us to believe that the Beast World is actually incredibly bright, vibrant, and hot during the day. Possibly a kind of rocky desert. To repeat a former point, I said that I felt like there was higher levels of carbon in the atmosphere, a heavier element that would make the air a bit harder to breathe. For us, at least. Carbon, specifically carbon dioxide, when carbon meshes with the oxygen in our atmosphere, is a greenhouse gas, which can warm the surface of a planet. See Venus, and global warming. So I think that my theory on carbon being more prevalent in their atmosphere could lead to a higher surface temperature. Now, let's look at Lily's clothing at the time. I couldn't find any official art of her in the outfit she was in there, so I had to make my own, sorry. Anyway, she's clearly not dressed for the cold. Neither is the player character. I mean, you can't really get winter clothes in Alola. Now, let's be honest, your character in-game has all the expression and personality of a piece of burnt toast. But the ever-expressive Lily doesn't complain about the cold at all. And from experience, caves tend to be pretty cold, ultimately, unless you're really deep down. And the sunlight trickling down in Lusamine's chamber... I don't think they're that far from the surface. Now, in all fairness, Lily not complaining about the cold is a very, very weak argument on its own. People in Japanese media, particularly women, are not known for wearing excessive amounts of clothing, and they're also not known for complaining about the cold because then the male-dominated creative teams would have to justify covering them up, and, you know, they don't want to do that. But the very next area you go to in-game after completing the part in Beast World is Mount Lanakila. Lanakila, am I saying that right? Mount Ka Lanakila itself is the coldest area in the game. Colder than a Bergmite whose birthday you forgot. Every character who appears there, their breath starts to vaporize and become visible, and you even get to sass Kukui about his exposed chest on top of the mountain, ask him if he's cold. But Kukui's chest aside, I'd hazard a guess that if they were willing to put in that much detail into recognizing the fact that it's cold as heck up there, then if the Beast World was that cold, they probably would have had similar signs or similar dialogue. 
at least the breath thing. That seems very easy for them to add. And the sun trickling down in the room that Lusamine's chilling in is probably responsible for that warmth in the cave. And if the cave is warm, how's the surface feel? So how might our precious beasts have evolved to adapt to that heat on the surface? That theoretical heat I'm proposing. Well, for one, something I noticed very early on, glossy bodies. Celestula, Cartana, Buzzswole, and Zerktree all have smooth, almost glossy bodies, and not a single one of the Ultra Beasts have fur. This is very likely an adaptation to reflect excess heat off their skin to keep their body temperature lower than it would otherwise be. It's like how in deserts people use shiny tarps to make shade because less heat is going to go through a shiny surface. And if you've ever had a thermal lunchbox, the inside is lined with some kind of foil-like substance that keeps the heat in, bouncing around off the reflective surfaces. Pheromosa and Nyligo are also kind of shiny, but I think that's for different reasons, which, again, I'll get into in a moment. The only one of the seven with a matte color scheme is Guzzlord, with the matte black skin. Another trait six of the seven share is minimal eyes. Nyligo and Zerktree are just completely without them. And honestly, I don't see any on Celestila. I mean, they might be there, but if they are, they're tiny. And something similar can be said for most of the others. Guzzlord, Buzzswole, and Cartana all have very small eyes. These teeny tiny eyes could be the result of a bright world in which they don't need large eyes to gather dim light, and instead would prefer to shade themselves from it. But there's a pretty big hole in this part of the theory. Pheromosa. She has huge eyes, even by anime standards. What's up with that? I would attribute that to her behavior. Here's an idea. Pheromosa might be a cave dweller or at least nocturnal. Given her penchant for speed and acceleration, which anyone who plays the game competitively has probably experienced by now, she's unlikely a cave dweller. Unless she has reflexes that put Spider-Man completely to shame and can zip through caverns and dodge obstacles with lightning-fast reflexes, which is possible and also sounds pretty cool visually. But it's more likely she simply hides in caves during the day, and then explores the surface of the world at night to travel and hunt. Even in-game, you find Pheromosa in the cave, and this bit's a stretch, but she's exclusive to Pokémon Moon, in which it's more about the nighttime, and when the Ultra Beasts descend to fight the Guardians, Pheromos is the one who shows up at night. Again, it's a stretch, but the connection is there. Whether or not it's valuable, I'll leave up to interpretation. Now, Nyligo itself, we know is a cave dweller. Its soft, goopy body probably doesn't really like exposure to the sun that much, any more than our world's jellyfish do, and we have actually seen its habitat. It's the only one we've seen in its natural habitat, which was that one cave. And when it does come to our world, the two places you can catch it are A, a cave, and B, a hot, dark volcano with clouds obscuring the sun. As for the last Ultra Beast, I think, that prefers the darkness? Guzzlord. It looks like a cave dweller, it's found in caves, and since it's endlessly eating raw material around it, it probably carves its own caves. Its black, matte texture body would probably also absorb a lot of heat if it went out into the sun, so it's probably pretty eager to avoid that. In my head, though I have no proof, I see extensive cave systems throughout Beast World, maybe because that's the only part of Beast World we ever saw. I wouldn't be surprised if those were carved by Guzzlords eating their way through the crust of the planet. So hot and sunny, possibly extensive caves. What else might Beast World have that seems likely? Probably most of what we have, just in different quantities. Due to the heat, liquid water just sitting around on the surface is probably pretty rare, so I imagine it's quite dry. 
again, harkening back to the desert idea I had before. Not a sandy desert, but more like a badlands. This is also supported by the fact that other than Zerk Tree being able to learn Rain Dance, not a single one of the Ultra Beasts can learn another water type move. Water is probably incredibly valuable, and they probably have their all their own ways of finding it and keeping it, much like desert life does in our world. Nyligo retains it by staying underground, Buzzwool stores it in its rippling masses. Celestila and Zerk Tree can root themselves into the ground to absorb water and nutrients. Guzzlord might get it from burrowing, finding underground water deposits, or just getting it straight from the rocks it eats. One only really needs to look at modern desert life to see the different ways and incredibly diverse ways that life can find and store water when it's scarce. Also, because of Zerk Tree and Celestila's tendency to root themselves in the ground, and Cartana's grass typing, I imagine there's plants there too. Sturdy, desert life plants that are good at keeping and retaining water. The plants would probably thrive off the sunlight, and if they're anything like our world's plants, probably the carbon in the atmosphere as well. Basically, on this mostly desert world, the life has evolved to adapt and survive and become very hardy and adaptable for its not cruel but difficult environment. Unfortunately though, now we come to a wall. Anything further than this is just baseless conjecture. I think that I've gone over almost every single piece of information we have on the Ultra Beasts, and if that didn't seem like much, it's not. <laughs> we have been given very little on this front. But even with what little we have, we've painted a picture of a world. An Earth-sized planet with an active yellow star, slightly higher carbon levels in its atmosphere, very dry but with water in certain places where life has evolved to find it. They've evolved to endure or avoid the sun, either by burrowing or becoming nocturnal. Feramosa is likely a nocturnal. Celestula, Cartana, and Buzzwool are probably diurnal. Nyligo and Guzzlord stay underground. I could probably go on about their potential behaviors and how their ability to sense ultra wormholes is sort of a mystery with its own implications. But this video is already long enough and it's got too much in it. I'm not even done yet, so. Really, something like that that just raises further questions, I'm not going to touch this time. But still, how can they just sniff it out naturally when we need special instruments? Are they just so used to these wormholes appearing and picking them off one by one? How unstable is the space around Beast World? Questions for later. I think we're almost done here. There's just one more sticking point I want to address before signing off. The extra-dimensional nature of this world. Personally, I think that plot point's really dumb. You can easily have an alien world without relying on multiverse theory. Bad comic book style multiverse theory. And I know this is clearly what Game Freak's going for. They love their multiverse idea, they started up in X and Y, and they've been running with it ever since. Does anyone remember Episode Delta from Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire? That basically just said multiverse, 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 multiverse. Extra dimensions. They've been consistent with it, but it still seems kind of dumb and unnecessary. Real multiverse theory isn't quite so convenient and clear-cut as the comic book multiverse theory they're going for. Though, again, that's a completely different video. Another theory floating around, mostly in my head, but I think I've seen it a few places on the internet, is that the Ultra Beasts are from the future. The future of the Pokémon world, accidentally falling back in time to the modern era. That also seems unlikely. If we're going with the assumption of the picture of the world I've painted already, then coming from an era with higher carbon content and warmer climate, either it's the result of global warming, or the sun has heated up five billion years in the future and is going to shortly destroy the Earth. 
Now, the first option seems unlikely because the Pokemon world is eco-friendly. It doesn't look like they're going to have to worry about global warming because they've already made peace with nature. I mean, that's been a theme in the game since Red and Green came out back in Japan in 96. And they really hammered that in, not so much with the plot and themes of Sun and Moon, but with the visual design. I mean, try to tell me you're not in love with the design of Alola, and how modern technology and the wilderness of the islands is meshed so beautifully. So really, I don't think they have to worry about global warming as much as we do. As for the uh, near-apocalyptic Earth scenario, I <laughs> say I'm jumping to conclusions, but that really doesn't seem like Game Freak's style. And as we've discovered over the last decade or so, Earth-sized planets aren't really uncommon. You don't need to justify another world with alien life on it with an extra dimension, because there's a good potential that they're all around us. I said that Beast World is around a yellow star, and based on the light filtering in from above and the level of radiation it's giving off, that's the most likely scenario, especially if it also has a day-night cycle. Most of the exoplanets we found recently that have really excited us have been around not yellow stars. They've been around red dwarfs. Long, long-lived stars that'll survive way past the time our sun will, but might have long-term homes for humanity in the future. Proxima b, which we found recently and are looking at with a lot of hope, is the closest exoplanet to our solar system. Not just the closest one right now, the closest one possible. Its host, Proxima Centauri, is named Proxima because it is the closest proximity to our star. It's the closest star to us at just over four light years away. If all goes well, who knows, it might be the next home of humanity. Then there's stuff like the Trappist system with seven Earth-sized planets orbiting around it, three of which are in the Goldilocks zone, the area where water can be water, not frozen or vaporize. It's just right. So the option is out there, in fact, is more likely that this is another planet within our same dimension. It would make more sense, but I think Game Freak's just been having a lot of fun with their multiverse theory, and yeah, I guess that's cool. What with the way astronomy's been going lately, it just seems like we don't need dumb multiverse theories like that to be as prevalent in media anymore. Or, overall, it's possible that they just threw a bunch of design choices together because they thought it would be cool without thinking about how it would relate to each other, just to make weird Pokémon that seemed unnatural, without thinking about where they came from. Game Freak tends to do a lot of research, like way more than anyone would think they would, especially when designing important or powerful Pokémon, like legendary Pokémon or possibly even the Ultra Beasts. But then again, we're dealing with aliens here. Who knows if they did their research or just decided to have fun with it and go nuts with some weird designs. I don't know if they bothered to plan them out in the level that I've connected them here so far, and if they even intend to continue with the idea in future games. I really hope they do. In the end, there's no way to prove these theories without Game Freak building on this idea further down the line. And I haven't even begun thinking where Solgaleo, Lunala, and Necrozma fit into all this. These are theories for another day. But I hope we all enjoyed some mental exercise and critical thinking for a bit. Tell me your theories on the Ultra Beasts in the comments, or on my social media. I'd love to discuss these things with people, because... Well, none of my friends are as interested in these things as I am. <laughs> Was there something important I missed? Should I do a video on real multiverse theory? Does this shirt make me look fat? I'll be reading it all as I work on my next video. After a bit more Zelda. Or, or Pokemon. I haven't picked up Moon in a while. Oh, where'd I put it? <laughs>